so um, thank you very much indeed, Massimo, for having accepted the invitation. And thanks for your generosity and the effort. Um, I have uh, some questions, but before that, I have an introductory note about you. Um, you can correct me or update me if something is missing there. Uh, Massimo Pilucci is an Italian-American philosopher and biologist. He is professor of philosophy at the City College of New York, former co-host of the uh, Rationally Speaking podcast and former editor-in-chief for the online magazine Scientia Salon. Among his books are uh, Nonsense on Stills, How to Tell Science from Bang 2010, Answers for Aristotle, How Science and Philosophy Can Lead Us to a More Meaningful Life, 2012, A Field Guide to a Happy Life, uh, 53 Brief Lessons for Living, 2020, uh, A Handbook for New Stoics, 2019, and the focus of our discussion today, How to Be a Stoic Using Ancient Philosophy to Live a Modern Life, 2017. So what drew my interest to the book Basically, was the translation, the Persian translation of the of the uh, of the book. Um, uh, so, Massimo, my first question is a personal question. I was the other day I was thinking because I mean, aside from your book and the uh, this this motivation based on the Persian uh, translation of the book, I was interested recently in Stoicism. I was wondering, I was asking myself, what my reasons for being attracted to Stoicism are, I couldn't really figure it out perfectly, but I guess it helps me personally, and based on my temperament, <laughs> to redress a balance in my character as Stoicism somehow stands in opposition to my, to my, to my temperament. Uh, what, what your reasons, I mean, what were your reasons personally to, 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 to pick, to pick Stoicism? I mean, uh, I guess you had a long journey with Stoicism. Yeah, it was a journey. First of all, thanks for having me. It's this is this is a it's a pleasure. Uh, look, stoicism is a philosophy of life, and pretty much we all have and need a philosophy of life, whether we realize it or not. Most of us grow up in a religious tradition, for instance. Uh, you know, in my case, Catholicism, uh, and those in religions. I think of religions as a type of philosophy of life, because a philosophy of life, broadly speaking, I think has at least three components. It has a metaphysics that is a account of how the world works. It has an ethics, which is an account of how you, you should behave in the world, given the way the world is, is set up. And then it has a set of practices. And these practices are meant to help you, in fact, you know, implement the ethics. So for instance, you know, growing up Catholic, as I said, the metaphysics, uh, includes things like there is a creator God that is external to space and time that created the universe that loves us, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in terms of ethics, you know, you follow the Ten Commandments, uh, the, the teachings of Jesus, you know, things like that. And in terms of practices, you know, you go to church, you listen to sermons, you read scriptures, you pray, things like that. So we all have a version or another of that, whether we are aware of it or not, whether we receive it through our parents and our you know society or or by other means. Now, in my case, as I said, I, I did grow up within a religious tradition, and then at some point I left it. I thought uh, increasingly uncomfortable with that tradition. I studied I started studying philosophy, and the philosophy put some doubts in my mind about certain aspects of Catholicism. So I've, at some point I thought that, nah, okay, this is not working for me. But the thing is, you can't just live without a philosophy. You still need some kind of framework, some kind of general idea of what the world is like and how to navigate it, right? So at some point I was going through a process of exploration of different alternatives, including uh, non-Western philosophies like Buddhism. And it, it struck me that there is a group of philosophies, a, a tradition that comes out of ancient Greece and Rome, which is referred to as virtue ethics, uh, which includes Aristotle, Epicurus, the Stoics, and, and many others, uh, particularly Socrates, beginning with Socrates. And that tradition is focused not on rules, you know, not on 
what is right and what is wrong, that kind of you know very simple, very straightforward, black or white kind of situation. It's really based on character. It basically tells you that the most precious thing you have is your own character, your own judgment, and that you should work to make it better, to improve it. So the question is not whether an action is right or wrong. The question is, is this action going to improve my character or is it going to undermine my character? And that struck a, a, a bell. That, that seemed right to me. That seems like helpful at the very least. I don't want to claim that that's the only way to go about uh, building a philosophy of life, but it did strike me as the right, you know, a, a right path. But then again, as I said, there are many different versions of virtual ethics. So I started studying and, and see whether one of those might, you know, resonate more clearly with me. And uh, it did. When I got, you know, to Stoicism, uh, the first thing, one of the first things that I read about Stoicism was Epictetus and his discourses. He was a second century Stoic philosopher. And the guy struck me as exactly, you know, very helpful. He is a non-nonsense kind of guy. He doesn't mince words. He has a sense of humor that I find uh, endearing and, and actually useful. But more generally, Stoicism is a broad, coherent philosophy of life. It has, it includes the the uh, notion that we should keep searching, however, that it's not a it's not a, a, a finalized set of anything. The Stoic, even the ancient Stoics, were clear that you know if we discover new things about the world, then we should change our mind about uh, you know certain certain assumptions that we that we hold. So that struck me as friendly to a modern science oriented or science informed view of the world. I'm a scientist as a background. Uh, so that struck me as as good. Again, again, I don't claim that virtual ethics in general or stoicism in particular are the only way to go about it, but it certainly are one very viable way. And it, it it's a way that resonated with me. Um, as you were saying earlier, it, it seems to be helpful in correcting certain tendencies in my character, in my own behavior that I recognize need to be corrected. Um, and uh, so it's, it's just, in, at the end of the day, the proof is in the pudding. It's useful. Uh, once I started practicing stoicism, you know, my friends and family started telling me, hey, you know, you seem like you're more calm, you know, you get less angry or upset about things. You seem to be uh, more serene. Uh, so it's like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's, help it's helpful. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, 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 I mean, you just mentioned that there are uh, quite a few actually systems of philosophy that can, I mean, that uh, one can use up, like you, in your time was like Catholicism and uh, some similar religious views. But what is the what is this? Um, what's for you? What makes for you Stoicism still today applicable? I mean, what is there that doesn't make it obsolete for you? Yeah. Well, there are some areas of Stoicism that are obsolete. Uh, for instance, some aspects of uh, Stoic metaphysics, I think, are are not useful anymore because they're not in line with the best science that we know. Uh, let me give you an example: the Stoics, the ancient Stoics thought that the universe itself is a living organism endowed with reason, what they call the logos. And which is a beautiful view. I mean, I wish I could believe it, um, you know, because if it then follows that we are literally bits and pieces of the universe that are also endowed with reason. And it also follows that uh, a type of kind of providence almost, right? So, so everything that happens to us is good for the universe. It's like, great. Except that I'm a scientist living in the 21st century. Modern science gives me no reason to believe that the universe is a living organism. I'm a biologist, so I know what a living organism is, and the universe doesn't fit that, that kind of description. Uh, I don't believe that the universe is impregnated with reason. There are reason-capable reason organisms within the universe, like us, but that doesn't make the universe as a whole uh, endowed with reason. So, so that part of metaphysics has to go. But the thing that uh, that, uh, that that makes me think that stoicism is still very valid is number one. As I said, 
a, minute, a moment ago, it has built in this ability to revise itself and to update. One of the most influential Stoics was the first century philosopher Seneca, uh, Seneca the Younger. are not our masters, they are our teachers. And if we discover new things and better ways of doing things, then it's up to us to implement them. Um, so there is a, there is this openness that you don't find necessarily in a lot of other philosophies. Also, much of what, uh, of the rest of, of uh, Stoic metaphysics, I find still pretty much current. That is, uh, it, you know, it's still, it's still a good idea. For instance, the Stoics were, Materialists, they thought that everything in the universe is made of matter. We would say matter and energy, but today we know that matter and energy are the same thing uh, because of Einstein's equation. Uh, they say, they think that everything that exists has causal powers and that uh, everything happens as a result of cause and effect. Well, I'm, I'm on board with that. I think that everything that, that happens does is the result of, of cause and effect. So large chunks of stoic metaphysics still work more importantly i think the stoic ethics really works and even perhaps more importantly or at least equally as importantly stoic exercises stoic practices still work so those are major reasons for me to embrace stoicism you know stoic ethics is about uh, ethical self-improvement uh, it's about becoming a better person and you do that by as the as the ancient stoics put it, uh, by living according to nature. And what they meant by that was by taking seriously human nature. They thought that human nature is the nature of a organism that is highly social and capable of reason. And therefore, for the Stoic, a good life is a social life, one where you, you try to be helpful to other people, and a life in which you exercise reason in order to solve your problems. That's that strikes me as very it's a very good idea um right so so the ethics still works and you know there are there are lots of details that we may get into later a little bit but that's the general picture in terms of practices also stoicism works very well and the major piece of evidence for that is that modern cognitive behavioral therapy which is one of the best evidence based psychotherapies was in fact it started in the 1950s and early 60s and it was inspired by stoicism the early cbt practitioners where you know they, they read marcus Aurelius and and epictetus and, and and other stoics and they thought hey these people are onto something so the kind of techniques that we find in stoic literature ancient stoic literature has have been updated and they still work very well we now have empirically based evidence that they that they work so given all that in other words what i'm saying is i guess is much, although not all of Stoic metaphysics is still valid, in my opinion. All of Stoic ethics, or most of Stoic ethics, is valid. And many, if not all, of the Stoic exercises are still useful. So that that's pretty good. That's uh, that's the reason why I, I stick with it. I think Stoicism does better than other uh, philosophies in that regard. Um, but again, as I said, it's not the only, the only path. I can right. see somebody doing Buddhism and yeah. doing just as well, you know, following yeah. the full, the four noble truths and the eightfold path to alignment. That still right. seems to work for a lot of people. Wonderful. Uh, Massimo, as I see in the book, the book has, I mean, the book has 14 chapters, if I'm not wrong, but three sections, three basic sections, the discipline of desire, the discipline of action, and the discipline of ascent. I would be thankful if you could elaborate on these three divisions. Yeah, uh, the the structure of the book follows the f the famous three disciplines of Epictetus, the the second century Stoic that I mentioned a minute ago, the one that has a good sense of humor. Epictetus was a uh, slave. He actually started out his life as a slave in Hierapolis, which is a modern day Pamukkale in in Western Turkey, and then he was acquired. In fact, we don't know his real name. Epictetus just means acquired. It, it, it means that he was bought. And he was uh, acquired by Nero's secretary, secretary, Epaphroditus, and was brought to Rome to the, to the court of Nero. 
because he was a bright guy, he was um, given the opportunity to study and to improve himself. And, uh, and he studied philosophy with Musonius Rufus, who was a major Stoic teacher at the time. Eventually, Epictetus gained his freedom. He started teaching philosophy. He got on the nerves of a later emperor, Domitian, because the Stoics had this attitude of speaking truth to power, and power usually doesn't like truth to be spoken. Um, so to them, so uh, so he was sent into exile by the emperor Domitian, uh, and he was uh, sent to northwestern Greece in a place called Nicopolis, which still exists today. And uh, and there, Epictetus restarted his his school, and he became one of the most, if not the most, sought after teacher of the early part of the second century. He influenced, uh, for instance, Marcus Aurelius, who was the emperor philosopher, who was also a Stoic. Now, Epictetus thought that um, there are three things we need to be concerned with uh, if we want to practice Stoicism, and he called them the disciplines. Well, actually, the term, the, the modern term comes from Pierre Hadot, who is a who was a, a French scholar who did much in the 1980s and 90s to uh, bring back philosophy, ancient philosophy, as a as a practical way of life, and particularly focused on sto on Stoicism. But the so-called three disciplines are really the three types of things that, according to Epictetus, we should be concerned with. And they are the ones that you mentioned. That is desire and aversion, action, and assent. Now, desire and aversion. Uh, so the first thing I have to understand there is we need to be careful because the English terms don't actually really translate very well the original Greek. And so when we think of desire, we, ten, we tend to think of things that are not actually what Epictetus is talking about. So let me rephrase them in, in a way that uh, perhaps might be more uh, intuitive and more easy to follow. So the discipline of desire and aversion is really about our values and disvalues. That is, what kinds of things should we value, desire, quote unquote, and what things we should disvalue, that should, we should say, that those are not the kinds of things that I want. And those are the aversions. An aversion is the opposite of a desire. So um, according to Epictetus, there's only one thing that we should desire, and that is good judgment. And according to uh, also Epictetus, there is only one thing that we should really be averse uh, to, and that is bad judgment. So in other words, the only thing that we really should be concerning ourselves with is to develop judgment, good judgment about things. Why is that? Well, the argument for that uh, is actually made by Socrates in one of the Platonic. And uh, Socrates says, look, if you don't have wisdom, if you don't have good judgment, then everything you're going to have, you're going to misuse. You think, for instance, that health is a good thing, that that money, you know, wealth is a good thing, that reputation, fame is a good thing. But that's true only if you use them well. If you don't use them well, they actually turn out to be bad things. Uh, so if you have, if, for instance, if you're a very wealthy person, uh, but you use that wealth in order to corrupt people or to gain uh, access to power that you don't actually deserve, and so on, and so forth, then it's bad. Then, then it turns out that wealth is actually a bad thing for both you, uh, yourself, because it actually undermines your character, and for the rest of humanity. So things that we take for granted that are good, such as health, education, wealth, uh, reputation, etc., uh, according to the Stoics, are not necessarily good. They may be or may not be. And what makes them good is our judgment. So the first discipline is about training ourselves to value the things that are really good and not the things that other people tell us are good. The second discipline is called of action because it's about acting in the world. So now that I know what what things are actually good and, or not good, then I, now I need to act accordingly. So when I act toward other people in society at large, I need to behave in agreement with my principles. So the second discipline is 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 about how to act in the world particularly with respect to other people since we are social animals and we almost always interact with other people. We rarely act on our, on our own. The third discipline is, is interesting because it's called of ascent 
assent is a uh, agreement, right? It's, it's if I assent on some to something, it means that I agree on something. And Epictetus says, look, the first two disciplines are the ones that you really need to be concerned with, but you also have to get good enough to, with those disciplines that you kind of you are able to apply them in your sleep, basically. Even if you um, if you're tired or if you're sick or something like that, you still know what the right thing to do is and you act accordingly. And the discipline of ascent is meant to create that situation, to make the first two automatic, essentially. Uh, think of it this way. It's like learning how to drive a car. Initially, when you start driving a car, you don't know what's going on, right? You have to pay attention, consciously pay attention to a bunch of things. The, the, uh, the streets, the street signs, the, uh, the light, the pedestrians, uh, the inside the car, the steering wheel, the the, the shift, the gears, uh, the the, um, the brakes, et cetera, et cetera. And initially it's kind of nerve wracking because it's so much stuff going on at the same time that you have to think about it carefully that uh, it's difficult and you might actually cause an accident. But when you start driving and then you drive more and more, you basically exercise your ability to drive. Eventually it becomes automatic. You, you, don't, you don't have to think about it anymore. It's not like you have to think, about oh where where is the, the 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 brake oh that's on the left where is the accelerator that's on the you don't it, your your feet automatically go there that's what Epictetus says we should do with our first two disciplines our knowledge of what is good and not good and our ability to act on it should become eventually automatic they should become the kind of thing that you do without even having to think about it. And that's what that's what the three disciplines are. Now, the book, as you correctly uh, stated, is organized around loosely organized around those three disciplines, because I do think that this general framework that Epictetus laid out, it's actually very useful is is because the book is about not only understanding stoicism, but also practicing stoicism, because if you just understand it and don't practice it, then you're wasting your time. Um, then I, I figure, well, it's good to introduce the reader to the three disciplines right off the bat uh, so that as they're reading, they be begin to understand better and better what the three disciplines are and how you actually put them into practice. Uh, wonderful. Uh, Massimo, one of the <clears throat> integral parts of, or let's say concepts that you introduce in the book, although concept perhaps is not, is not sufficient talking about Stoics, uh, is the dichotomy of control. I have um, I have um, a part from, not from your book, but from um, Enchi Enchiridion, from Epictetus, a quote. There are, I'm quoting him, there are things which are within our power and there are things which are beyond our power. Within our power, our opinion, aim, desire, aversion. And in one word, whatever affairs are our own, Beyond our power, our body, property, reputation, office, and in one word, whatever are not uh, properly our own affairs, end of quote. Um, why is it that significant for you and the Stoics in the book? So the one you just read, which you're right, modern Stoics refer to it often as the dichotomy of control, although the problem is that the word control, it's a little bit ambiguous and so that creates all sorts of you know misunderstandings epictetus himself actually calls it the fundamental rule he calls it he refers to it as the fundamental rule of life meaning that it's in his opinion that is the most important thing he said if one thing you're gonna get out of stoicism that should be the one now you read the, the quotation from the enchiridion uh that quotation is very important because Epictetus lays down there two principles. The first one, he says, he divides things um, in two categories, right? Things that are up to us and things that are not up to us. Or as you say, things over which we have power and things over which we don't have power, right? Um, then the second thing that he does is he gives you a list. He says, under our power, our opinion, etc., etc., and not under our power are things like body, reputation, etc. Now, in modern, again, the, the English words don't actually quite do a justice to the original Greek. So let's try to rephrase 
what he's actually saying. At the end of the day, he says, the only things that are up to us are our judgments, what he calls opinions and, you know, and uh, decisions to act and not to act, things like that. Those are all judgments. My opinions are judgments. Uh, my decision to act or not to act are judgments. So the only thing that are truly up to us, according to Epictetus, are our ways, our intentions, our ways of, of judging and evaluating things. Everything else, he says, is external to us and not really under our control. Notice that he, he starts, he, he, he has a list of things that are outside of our control. And he starts with something that might be surprising for most people, right? He starts with the body. He says that our own body is not up to us. And it's like, what do you mean, right? I, I can certainly, you know, go to the gym and exercise and I can go to the doctor and take care of my health. I can, uh, you know, eat a healthy diet. And, you know, that's, I can do all those things. But Epictetus would say, yes, but all of those are your judgments, right? So you have the judgment of that it's good to exercise, the judgment that it's good to go to the doctor and practice preventive medicine, the judgment that it's good to eat healthy food instead of junk food and, and so on and so forth. The outcome of those actions, right? So because of your judgments, you initiate certain actions. You, you, I, I have the judgment, for instance, that it's good for me to exercise. So I initiate the, the action that it is going to the gym. But the outcome of those actions are not up to me because I can exercise all I want. I can eat a healthy diet. I can go to the doctor on a regular basis. And then a tiny little virus comes in and kills me. Um, or I cross the street and a car hits me and I go to the hospital because I broke my, my legs, uh, or all sorts of stuff can happen. So what Epictetus is telling us there is that there's a distinction between our intentions to do certain things and the outcomes of those intentions. And he's saying, keep in mind that the intentions are really up to you. You're responsible for those intentions. If I say, uh, to myself, you know what? I don't feel like going to the gym today. I'm going to stay home, watch the TV and, and eat junk food, right? Well, I'm responsible for that choice. If there are negative consequences of, of that choice, that choice started with me. I am responsible for it. However, the again, the final outcome is not, it's not up to me because it depends on a lot of other things that are outside uh, of my control. The same exact thing uh, you know, reasoning applies to all the other things that Epictetus mentions. Uh, your wealth, for instance. I mean, you can take care of your wealth. You can invest correctly. You can save money, you know, try to save money, et cetera, et cetera. But then the stock market crashes and all of a sudden you're penniless, right? And the stock market crash is not up to you. Or uh, your reputation. You can, you know, how do you, how do you preserve your reputation? Well, by acting you know, as a decent person and trying to be helpful to people, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, somebody can start a rumor uh, behind your back and people start believing the rumor uh, and the rumor ends up on social media and all of a sudden, you know, your reputation is ruined and so on and so forth. You can apply that same concept to do to everything. Now, what is the point of the dichotomy of control? Epictetus basically says, look, your life is going to be much better and you're going to be much more focused if you pay attention only and exclusively to the things that are up to you and then develop an attitude of acceptance and equanimity for the things that are not up to you. This idea, it's by the way, not just Stoic, it's found in other traditions. It's actually found in, in uh, I think, 8th century Buddhism. It's found in, in Judaism. It is even found in Christianity. Uh, some of, uh, some people may have heard of the Serenity Prayer. The Serenity Prayer is a early 20th century prayer written by an American theologian, and it's used at the begin. Usually, it's used at the beginning of meetings of 12-step organizations like Alcoholic Anonymous. And the Serenity Prayer essentially asks God to give us the wisdom to tell the difference between what we can change and what we cannot change, the courage to act on what we can change, to actually change things, and the, wisdom, the, the serenity to accept things that we cannot change. Essentially, that's Epictetus. It's, and in fact, this is no surprise because the medieval Christians were highly influenced by Epictetus's handbook. 
and they actually used it as a training manual for monks in monasteries and you know things like that so it's it's actually no surprise that christianity has used the same concept so in the book i say that the uh, the dichotomy of control or the fundamental rule is incredibly useful because it's diff it's very simple to understand but it's very difficult to practice right it's uh, it takes time to actually internalize this this distinction and yet it has basically countless applications um, one of which i actually talk in the, you know, just an ex as an example uh, i talk about an episode in the book uh, that really did occur to me uh, i was in rome um, in fact i was writing the book i was um, on, on sabbatical and i was in rome visiting uh, and and spending time writing the book so one day my brother and his wife invite me for uh, dinner and to go over for, and, and, and have dinner and go to the movies and i said yeah sure that's uh, that'd be That'd be nice. So I get into the subway. And as soon as I get into the subway, even though the subway was not very crowded, I have to, I feel this guy right in front of me that's kind of pushing very hard uh, as if the subway was sort of full of people. And I thought, what the hell is going on here? That that's, uh, doesn't make any sense. And in a split second, I realized that he was distracting me so that his friend could pick my pocket and run away with my wallet. Okay. So by the time I realized this, it was too late. But the two were had already jumped out of the subway. The, the, the doors were closed, and I was on my way to meet my brother without my wallet. So I lost my cash. I lost my credit cards. I lost my driver license, you know, everything. Now, normally, um, I would have reacted with anger and frustration and even humiliation because, like, wait a minute, this is my city. I grew up here. I never been pickpocketed in my life, and now it's 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 Rome, and and these these two idiots are gonna you know just have been successful in doing something that really should not be happening. So that would have been the normal reaction, right? So humiliation, frustration, anger, all that sort of stuff. Instead, the first thing that came to my mind was Epictetus, and I thought, okay, what would Epictetus do here? Uh, well, he would say that forget about the wallet; it's done. You cannot recover it. They're out. Uh, there is nothing you can do about it. So no worry. Don't worry about it. Why, why are you going to worry about something that you cannot act on? What can you act on? That is, where is what is up to me in this particular situation? Well, a number of things. So I fortunately I they didn't pick my phone. I had my phone with me, you know, smartphone. So the first thing that I did was to get on the website of my credit card companies and alert them that the credit cards have been stolen. So they blocked them and they sent immediately a replacement in the in the mail. The second thing I did was to get on the website of the Department of Motor Vehicles and notify them that my driver's license had been stolen. And interestingly, they blocked that one and immediately sent me a, a temporary one via as a PDF file on online. So by the time, three, three subway stops later, by the time I met my brother, everything was fine. I had, you know, my credit cards had been blocked my, 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 uh, and replaced. My uh, driver license had been replaced. I had no cash, but, you know, I was meeting my brother. So I said, you know, it's up to you now to buy me dinner because, uh, you know, uh, this happened. And he looked at me, he's like, well, and you're not upset. And I said, well, it wouldn't help. It's it, it's not it's not you know what am I upset? That's the second part of the economy of control, right? Deva or the serenity prayer. Develop an attitude of acceptance and and equanimity toward things. If something happens and you cannot do anything about it, then getting upset just adds self-inflicted injury to to the insult that you already received. So why would you want to do that? That same general idea, the, the economy of control, applies. Pretty much everything from small things, you know, small little irritations that you might have during the day to really big things. For instance, in the case of uh, loved ones who die, it's the same general idea. You know, I lost both of my parents, for instance, recently. I lost my stepfather. And there, too, immediately the Epictetus rule came to mind. It's like, OK, what can I do here? Uh, well, one of the answers is I can be a comfort to my siblings uh, or to, you know, to some of my relatives. What can I not do? I cannot bring these people back. So I have to accept what, right. what is happening and, uh, and deal with it that way. Wonderful. Great. 
I, I also really enjoyed the examples of the book. Uh, Massimo, I have a I have a another quote. I have another quote from from Seneca this time. Uh, I'm quoting him. There is a great difference between the joy and the pain. If I am asked to choose, I shall choose the former. I shall choose the former and avoid the latter. The former is according to nature and the latter contrary to it. So long right. as they are rated as uh, by, by this standard, there is a great gulf between. But when it comes to a question of the virtue involved, the virtue in each case is the same, whether it comes through joy or through sorrow, end of quote. Um, it seems that the point here for Seneca is integrity. And I see that sometimes, um, sometimes in relation between happiness and integrity, happiness is more popular. I mean, not sometimes, often it is more popular than, than, in, than, than integrity. What is your take on this point, especially in relation to all the books that are written on happiness, all the seminars that are given on happiness and so on and so forth? Yeah, I, I love that quote from, from Seneca. It is one of my favorite. And essentially, you're, you're right. What he's saying is like, look, I'm not stupid. I'm not crazy. I do prefer joy and avoidance of pain. But sometimes pain is inev inevitable. And in both cases, what's important is how I handle either the joy or the pain, right? So that's that's a different way of saying what Epictetus is saying. That is that the most important thing is your judgment, is how you handle things. Uh, joy is not necessarily a good thing if it's joy about the wrong things. You know, being joyful about, you know, torturing a, a kitten, it's not a good, it's not a good thing. Uh, it undermines your character, makes you into a monster. So you have to have joy for the proper things. And the same goes for pain. Pain is sometimes inevitable, the either physical pain if you're, you know, if you're sick or uh, emotional, psychological pain uh, for things that happen in your life. And the sometimes you can't do anything about it other than deal with it, other than, you know, react basically uh, uh, virtuously, as, as Seneca would say. Now, back to your question. Yeah, I do think there is a little too much emphasis recently on, on sort of think positively and, you know, happiness and all that sort of stuff and not enough uh, emphasis on the fact that sometimes that's just not possible. I mean, to think positively is can be a, a, a foolish thing to do if, you know, if you're in a situation where there is not much positive, you have, you have to deal with that situation. Uh, I actually have friends and relatives in the past who have been through pretty difficult situations, like for instance, a cancer diagnosis. And if there was one thing that pissed them off is other people telling them to think positively. It's like, you know, what do you mean think positively? I got cancer. There's nothing positive about it. Now, if by that you mean don't give up, right? And and keep fighting, sure. But that's but that's different from thinking positively. There's nothing positive about the situation. It's just a situation that you have to. Uh, you know that you uh, that that anybody would want to avoid um, because it's contrary to nature, as as Seneca would say. Uh, but you have to deal with it, and so the only way to deal with it is to face it as it is and try to do try to do your best. Now, part of the problem here is the word happiness, uh, because the, the word happiness is a little too vague. You know, everybody wants to be happy. Yes, of course. But what do we mean by happiness? Uh, sometimes people just refer to happiness as a in the moment kind of feeling, right? I'm happy to see you, for instance, or I'm happy that this meal is, is wonderful, you know, that sort of stuff. Okay, that's certainly one thing to do, but life is not, you cannot sustain that kind of happiness, uh, you know, constantly. This would, this would be psychologically impossible for human beings, nor necessarily do I think that would be actually advisable. <laughs> Uh, to try to sustain that kind of psychological happiness all the time. Now, sometimes, on the other hand, people say, no, what I mean by happy is that I am happy with my life in general, that is, with the trajectory of my life, where I am in life, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so let's not use the same word then for, for those things because it's very confusing. There is a reason why even modern psychologists um, even within the branch of psychology that it, these days is referred to as positive psychology, uh, for instance, uh, they don't use the word happiness often these days. They use the Greek word, eudaimonia. Uh, 
Uh, eudaimonia is the word that you find in the Stoics, in Aristotle, in you know, in uh, in all the ancient uh, Greek and Roman sources, and it's translated differently uh, in 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 different contexts. So it used to be translated as happiness, and then people realized that that's a that's really a bad idea. So let's not do it. Sometimes it's it's uh, translated as flourishing, which I think gets closer to the original idea. So this is whatever makes you thrive in life, whatever makes you flourish, uh, represents your eudaimonia. But actually, I think that the best way, the most general way to translate eudaimonia is something on the lines of a life worth living. And a life worth living may not necessarily be a happy life. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, think about people like uh, Nelson Mandela, who spent 27 years of his life in prison. You would hard, hardly say that Nelson Mandela was happy. You know, it's like, eh, that, that just doesn't fit very well, the description of, of that kind of life. And yet, because of the reason why he was in prison, you know, fighting against injustice on behalf of his people and all that sort of stuff, one can say that that was a life worth living, that there was a reason for it, uh, that he, you know, he was a human being, so he made his own mistakes, of course. But overall, this was the kind of life that we recognize as worth living, so much so that Nelson Mandela is a role model for a lot of people, right? So a life worth living means that, sure, if, if it's a life of joy, mostly joy and mostly positive things, good for you, you know, uh, you, you're lucky. <laughs> um, but the Stoics would say there is value, there is much value in your life, even if it is a life of mostly sorrow, pain, and, and, and you know, setbacks and so on and so forth, so long as you're using your reason to go through it and you're being pro-social, that is, you're trying to be helpful to other people. That is, according to the Stoics, what really gives meaning to your life. Right. The fact that you are sociable and 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 pro-reason, reasonable. Wonderful. And I think there's, there's value to that because it means that anybody can have a good life, a life worth living, a eudaimonic life in that in that sense. In it's, a, in it's a, in... outside, you know, it's not outside of anybody's reach mm -hmm. in that way. Mm -hmm. uh... Let's shift to another topic, namely the way they handle, Stoics handle insults or handle any kind of offense. The Stoics advice is actually also according to the practical part of the book, your book, is to pause and take a deep breath. Because as you put it, I'm quoting you, if someone succeeds in provoking you, realize that your mind is complicit in provocation, end of quote. Here, humor, apparently plays a big role as a way to consider the issue dispassionately, although it is certainly hard to pull it off. But I wonder if humor has more to offer in stoicism in general. Yeah, a sense of humor, as um, uh, the American comedian Mel Brooks once put it, is a big defense against the universe, right? So um, it, having a sense of humor is helpful, I guess, no matter what the what the circumstances, because it puts things in perspective. It, it, it reminds you that you're really a tiny little speck of, of, of a biological being on a tiny little planet in the, you know, in a, in a corner of a galaxy at the, at the border of the universe. And therefore that, uh, things are not as as important or things are not as as dramatic as you might might think so you know there are in ancient um in the ancient world there, there was a, a famous contrast between two philosophers um uh, that 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 had different attitudes so to speak toward toward setbacks one attitude was everything is drama and the only proper reaction is uh, to cry about it it's like it's it's like you know it's everything is bad and it's like it's this is not a good thing um the philosopher heraclitus who was a pre-socratic apparently ad adopted this kind of attitude he thought everything is bad and and the only thing is you know is to accept that that life is just it's drama it's a it's a bad thing uh, and he was referred to uh, throughout in antiquity and the middle ages as the the crying philosopher um 
And then there was there's the opposite attitude, which is no, everything is actually comedy, uh, and the proper proper reaction is to laugh about it, uh, to to shrug it off because there's not much else you can do. Um, and uh, Democritus, who was an also a pre-Socratic philosopher, is often referred to as the laughing philosopher for that reason. You can actually look up there's a number of uh, paintings uh, in uh, during the Renaissance that that feature these two philosophers. Uh, facing each other, you know, the, the laughing one and the and the crying one. Now, I'm not suggesting that a sense of humor or laughing is necessarily appropriate under all conditions, right? I mean, there are, you know, you don't, you don't want to laugh at a funeral, for instance. Um, but this is about laughing at yourself, not at other people. Right? So this is this is not about making fun of other people. This is about reminding yourself that you should be taking things with a large grain of salt, with with a large sense of, you know, this is just not as much of a big deal. So in particular, the example that you just uh, brought up of insults. Yes, the Stoics think that that you are complicit in insults if, if you allow uh, people to upset you. Because after all, what is an insult exactly? Well, it's somebody coming to you and opening their mouth and, and talking, right? And then you hear what they're saying. Up to that point, nothing has happened. I mean, these, these people are just talking. And it doesn't matter what they're saying unless you actually let them upset you. Right? But, it, but why would you do that? Um, there are only, Epictetus says, there are only two possibilities here. Either the insult is, in fact, false let's say for instance somebody comes up to me and says hey massimo you, you really are fat aren't you and there are two possibilities one it may be true i may actually have gained weight a little bit and you know maybe i i've not been very careful and all that in which case i should say my the proper reaction according to petitus should be oh thank you i didn't notice that um, i'm gonna work on it or it's false it's like, what are you talking about, man? I'm perfectly fine. I'm, I'm perfectly fit. In which case, the embarrassment is actually on the person who has uh, insulted you because he's actually saying something false. Either way, there is no reason to get upset. Um, in fact, getting upset for an insult as a result of an insult, it's really doing the, exactly what the person who wants to insult you uh, is after, right? I mean, they're, they're not after a a reasonable response along the lines of, oh, yeah, thank you for telling me. <laughs> or they're not about, I was like, well, what, what do you mean? I'm okay. They are they are after making you upset. And so you are the one that allows them. Now, Epictetus suggests that there are two responses to that possibility, to, that, to, the, to an insult. The simple one, which we can all implement, is simply to walk away, to just ignore it. Like, okay, that, that takes no effort. Somebody insults you and you just ignore it. You keep keep going and do what, what you were doing. Not only that is very effective because the other person is kind of like, what the hell? I thought if he was going to get upset and this guy is not even reacting. So it's, it's actually very effective. It's also a practice of one of the stoic virtue, which, which virtues, which is temperance, self-control, right? In order not to respond, you have to exercise self-control. And so you're, now you're getting, you know, uh, as the Americans say, you're killing two birds with one stone. Uh, that is, you're both exercising one of your virtues and you're not giving satisfaction to the other person. If you are more sophisticated, if you feel more self-confident, then you can respond with humor. But the humor that Epictetus uh, suggests, again, is self-deprecating humor, not, not a zinger that sort of, does a counter insult not you're not you're not supposed to be insulting the other person in in, in exchange it's self-deprecating humor there's a good example of it in in the discourses uh, in Epictetus's discourses um one of his students uh, comes in and says to Epictetus hey you know that guy has been saying bad things about you um and Epictetus response is oh well that's only because he doesn't know me very well otherwise he would be saying much worse so that's self-deprecating humor that people yeah. laugh at, at that. Yeah, yeah. It is self-deprecating. But at the same time, of course, you have completely deflated uh, whatever the insult was. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's uh, that's a wonderful strategy in, in face of um, any sort of offense. But what I I mean, I had the impression the reason I asked that question was that 
or is that? I have the impression that in a stoicism, you have more a specific version of irony than humor. In other words, I, I mean, as you say, for example, in the book, you say that um, a stoicism shouldn't be interpreted as counseling a, a fatalistic or defeatist attitude. So far, so good. Um, and you suggest later that both suggest uh, that we step back and analyze the situation more rationally, always right. keeping in mind the dichotomy of control uh, between what is and what is not in our power, end of quote. For me, that is more um, uh, in this attitude, in this dichotomy of control reminder, there is more a kind of attempt to recast or reinterpret or rephrase the situation, which is closer to, to irony than to humor. You know, like even, even the way that Richard Rorty explains humor is like to reformulate the situation, you know, uh, sorry, irony. Uh, irony so right. for, for me, exactly, for me, that's kind of a Socratic um, inheritance that you see in the mm -hmm. Stoics, that is this tendency to, although it is more self, as you say, addressing yourself, it is self, you know, you know it's, it's more, uh concerning yourself than other people yes i think you're absolutely right uh on, on on several grounds first of all yes the proper term is is irony rather than humor there is a reason why uh we talk about socratic irony right and not socratic humor <laughs> uh for precisely that reason that that, that is and, and you're absolutely right also that the stoics do get it from socrates in fact the stoics themselves ref they refer to their philosophy as socratic uh, they they clearly saw themselves as followers of Socrates. Uh, you know, we we use a separate word for it, Stoics instead of Socratics. But they themselves actually thought of 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 what they were doing as following straight out of of Socrates. So uh, the use of a sense of of irony, mostly self deprecating, is what you see in, in Socrates uh, himself. You know, Socrates keeps going around saying, telling people that he doesn't know anything. You know that he's he's ignorant. He's you know, and and that's why the uh, oracle at Delphi, which by the way, it's the picture is behind me. That's mm -hmm. that's uh, it's not the oracle, but it's the Delphi. It's the it's the <laughs> temple of Athena at Delphi. Delphi. Uh, that's well, why the oracle yeah, at Delphi yeah. said that Socrates was the wisest man in in Greece. Right? It's like, well, what do you mean? Well, he was wise of uh, wisest than other people because he realized that he didn't know much. Other people thought that they had knowledge and then when they started when they when Socrates started asking them questions they it turns out they didn't actually know crap so uh so they were not wise in that sense they they did not know themselves right one of the famous uh, injunctions of the oracle at Delphi was know thyself understand yourself and one of the first things that Socrates says that we should understand about ourselves is that we don't know as much as we think we know um, so it's in a sense it's it's humility, but it's a humility grounded in a sense of irony, uh, and and particularly self irony, yeah, self directed irony. Um, Massimo, this, this interestingly brings me to another quote, to, to another uh, quote that I chosen uh, for this talk from Robert Musil that you also mentioned in the book. I'm quoting him: "In life, one usually means uh, by a stupid person who is lit a little weak in the head." But beyond this, there are the most varied kinds of intellectual and spiritual deviations, which can so hinder and frustrate and lead astray even an under, undamaged innate intelligence that it leads by and large to something for which the only word language here uh, has at its disposal is still stupidity. I mean, here, interestingly, uh, end of quote, um, Robert Musil is talking about two kinds of stupidity. One of them is actually honorable a stupidity, as he calls it. Yeah. Um, yep. um, in, in a comment to this text, another German writer, Eric Vogelin, observes that such stupidity pertains less to intellect than to the whole of consciousness in its unified spiritual being and significance. Intelligent yep. stupidity, as he calls it, I'm quoting him, has at its adversary not so much the understanding as the spirit or geist. And if one is willing to imagine as a spirit, not merely a little heap of emotions, the sensibility as well. So interestingly, when you were, when you were talking about this kind of ignorance, um, 
the opposite of ignorance in that scenario does not guarantee wisdom. So we have ignorance, we have knowledge, but this talk is talking about wisdom. Socrates yeah. is talking about wisdom, which is out of this dichotomy, actually. Yes. So that's right. So so the, the kind the two kinds of stupidity you're talking about, you're referring to, are uh, very important to distinguish. And one of the again, one of the unfortunate things here is the use of the English terms, right? Uh, if you use the same term stupidity for both, then people get confused, unfortunately. Uh, but there is stupidity as normally understood. That is, you know, somebody who's just not that bright. And it's not, you know, uh, it, the, the mental ability is just not there. And so it's like, okay, so that person isn't going to win a Nobel Prize or that person isn't going to be doing well in math or, you know, whatever it is. That's what most people understand by, by stupidity. But what Socrates is talking about and what the, what the Stoics are talking about uh, and then you refer to it as intelligent stupidity, which sounds like an oxymoron, right? It's like, what do you mean? How can you be intelligent and stupid at the same time? Um, but it, there is a reason why that, that term is used. This is the kind of stupidity that really translates better as lack of wisdom, unwisd or unwisdom, right? So you can be intelligent, you can be knowledgeable, and yet not wise. Uh, one of the quintessential examples of such a person in antiquity was Alcibiades, who was a student and friend of Socrates, as it turns out. And, you know, he was, uh, uh, he was very rich, very handsome, very smart in the sense, in the norm normal sense of, you know, being a, a, somebody who was quick-witted and, you know, had a lot of knowledge and all that, but he lacked wisdom. And, Socrates tells him there is a there is a platonic dialogue called the Alcibiades Meyer, where Socrates basically tells Alcibiades, like, you know, you need to be careful because you're very ambitious, but you also lack wisdom. And ambition, the combination of ambition and, and lack of wisdom, it's it's lethal. It's a it's a bad, it's a bad combination. Sure enough, historically we know that Alcibiades went on, became a major statesman and, and general in Athens, and basically was at least half responsible for the defeat of Athens in the Peloponnesian War against uh, Sparta, which was a disaster. Uh, and even in, in, at, the end, at the end, he gets killed uh, because uh, he has made so many enemies uh, through his unwise behavior, right? And, and Socrates told him 20 years earlier, like, you know, this, you're, you're not gonna end up well, and Athens is not gonna end up well if they follow you because uh, you lack um, the kind of wisdom that is necessary in order to be, that's just as important, in fact, arguably more important than standard intelligence or knowledge. Now, it is an interesting question. What is the relationship between wisdom and knowledge, for instance, and as well as uh, knowledge and information? I mean, those are all related uh, subject, you know, they're all related topics. But just because you're inform you have information, let's say you can Google things, for instance, uh, you come up with a lot of information. That doesn't mean you have knowledge, because knowledge is about understanding how to place that information properly. Right? You can have a lot of data, uh, you know, running through your computer. But if you don't make sense, you cannot make sense of those data. You cannot put them into some kind of general framework. Then you don't have knowledge. You just have data. Um, but knowledge by itself doesn't get you wisdom. Wisdom is critical reflection, especially self-critical reflection on the meaning of the information and knowledge that you have, right? So you can be very knowledgeable about certain things and yet completely unwise about mm -hmm. uh, you know, how to act, actually act in, in the world, which, as I said, was the problem with, with Alcibiades. And in fact, in order to be wise, you don't necessarily need a lot of knowledge. You don't need to be a rocket scientist or an engineer or, you know, a Nobel Prize winner in order to be wise. You do, I would argue, you do need some level of knowledge. You need to understand, have some understanding of the world and how it works. Otherwise, you cannot be wise um, because wisdom is about acting properly in the world. And if you don't understand how the world works, then then you cannot be wise, but you don't need a lot of knowledge. Um, and certainly you don't need a PhD in order to be wise. In fact, mm -hmm. I know a lot of PhDs uh, mm -hmm. who are not actually very wise. <laughs> uh, Massimo, one of the interesting authors you mentioned is Pierre Adot. I mean, one of the yeah. very uh, uh, 
the famous figures. In, in one of his articles, Forms of Life and Forms of Discourse in Ancient Philosophy, he says, I'm quoting him, by the time of the Platonic Dialogues, Socrates was called atopos, that is unclassifiable. What makes Socrates atopos is precisely the fact that he's a philosopher in the etymological sense of the word. That is, he's in love with wisdom. For wisdom, says the Atomia in Plato's Symposium, is not a human state. It is a state of perfection, of being and knowledge that can only be divine. It is this love of wisdom, which is foreign to the world, that makes a philosopher a stranger, end of quote. That word is interesting for me, stranger. Yeah. Do you think philosophy, or specifically stoicism, can function as a topos or unclassifiable? When I am, like personal <laughs> digression here, when I am in Iran, and here I try only to be amusingly generalizing, um, I think being a stoic is closest to uh, a happy or even meaningful life, eudaimonia, as you said. But when I am in Germany, to be honest, I have the hunch that for me, a meaningful or let's say a, a, a strange sense of like unclassifiable is more in, uh, in, in, in being a cynic rather than being a stoic. Interesting. Um, you, what, what is your understanding? Do you think that sometimes they have context, you know, like with the kind of emotions that are, are, are working through me in Iran? I think that hard thing, the courage is to really take a moment, take a deep breath and then reflect and act, you know. But when I am here and I see that people are acting actually like generally dispassionately, I think that no, being a cynic, being a provocative cynic, Perhaps like the, the Diogenes is more a philosopher. Well, certainly being a philosopher does mean that you adapt to the situation. And so depending on what uh, what the people around you are doing or what the society at large uh, uh, around you is, uh, that may call for different ways of acting. Um, so I, in that sense, I'm not surprised actually that when you move between two different worlds, uh, you feel like your your best way forward is different in those two different worlds. However, in general, I do agree with Hato that philosophy is unclassifiable or is atopical in, uh, in in the way in which he puts it, because I see philosophy as the connective tissue that that connects everything else. So I, you know, there are specific fields of inquiry and specific fields of study, such as biology, for instance, in my case, as a scientist or physics or engineering, or if you go into the humanities, you know, literature, history, and so on and so forth. And then there is philosophy. And I see philosophy, one of the things that are really attracting me to philosophy when I switched my career from science uh, to philosophy is precisely this notion that philosophy underpins everything else and connects everything else. It's not a field per se. If you if you ask you know well, what does what does a philosopher do, uh, the answer is the philosopher thinks about other stuff, and the other stuff is the the specific fields that other people pursue. So there are lots of fields of knowledge, but how do you make sense of those fields of knowledge? How do you connect them with each other? How do you derive wisdom out of that knowledge? Because as we said a minute ago, wisdom and knowledge are not the same thing. Well, that's the job of the philosopher. Uh, at least ideally. I mean, uh, you know, you can you can argue that modern academic philosophers have kind of lost their way in that mm -hmm. in that sense. Uh, and uh, we need we need to get back to it. But certainly in the sense of what Socrates was doing, in the sense of what mm -hmm. uh, the Stoics were doing, uh, they were trying that their goal was wisdom because they were in love with wisdom. Uh, mm -hmm. It wasn't just knowledge. They yeah. saw knowledge. This, this, the Stoics did study uh, what we today call science, uh, you know, uh, uh, and logic, as well as logic. They thought that it was important to study both science and logic because that gets you a better understanding of the world. But those studies, that understanding, were in the pursuit of wisdom. They were not for their own sake. They, they would not study logic for the, for the sake right. of logic. They would study logic because that helps them live a good life. I, I, Masum, I wonder if I have time for one last question, one short question sure. to finish. Um, that's interesting for me to 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 see how you answer that question. Do you think stoicism has a more crucial role in the age of uh, sensitization, in the age of identity politics, celebration of anger and emotions? 
Yes, I do. Uh, again, it's not the only um, tool that we can use. You know, there are other people that use different uh, different paths, and they work just as well. But I think the Stoics, uh, Stoicism is in fact 